world. Let's hear some ideas. Oh, oh. Villains don't raise hands. Sorry. Villains don't say sorry. Oh, right. Uh. <laughs> okay, to take over the world, we will use our vast wealth and business connections to buy and control politicians, who will then advance our evil agendas through the legislative process. We'll also want to buy a network of media outlets in order to garner public support for the politicians we control. Within several years, we will be running the world without anyone even knowing. Evil girl! You crossed the line. And these ideas are supposed to be fun! The question of how and why the United Nations is the crux of the great conspiracy to destroy the sovereignty of the United States and the enslavement of the American people within a UN One World Dictatorship is a complete and unknown mystery to the vast majority of the American people. The reason for this unawareness of the frightening danger to our country and to the entire free world is simple. The masterminds behind this great conspiracy have absolute control of all of our mass communications media, especially television, the radio, the press, and Hollywood. We all know that our State Department, the Pentagon, and the White House have brazenly proclaimed that they have the right and the power to manage the news, to tell us not the truth but what they want us to believe. They have seized that power on orders from their masters of the great conspiracy. And the objective is to brainwash the people into accepting the phony peace bait to transform the United States into an enslaved unit of the United Nations One World Government. Is that our so-called leaders in Washington, whom we elected to safeguard our nation and our constitution, are the betrayers, and that behind them are a comparatively small group of men whose sole objective is to enslave the whole world of humanity in their satanic plot of one world government. Now, as a matter of further intelligence, a term used by the FBI, let me clarify the meaning of the expression, he is a liberal, the enemy, meaning the One World Conspirators, have seized upon that word liberal as a cover-up for their activities. It sounds so innocent and so humanitarian to be liberal. We'll make sure that the person who calls himself a liberal or is described as a liberal is not in truth a red. Now then, this satanic plot was launched back in the 1760s when it first came into existence under the name of the Illuminati. This Illuminati was organized by one Adam Weishaupt, born a Jew, who was converted to Catholicism and became a Catholic priest. And then, at the behest of the then newly organized House of Rothschild, defected and organized the Illuminati. Naturally, the Rothschilds financed that operation. And every war since then, beginning with the French Revolution, has been promoted by the Illuminati operating under various names and guises. In the United States, they set up what they called the Council on Foreign Relations, commonly referred to as the CFR. And this CFR is actually the Illuminati in the United States. And its hierarchy, the masterminds in control of the CFR, to a very great extent, are the descendants of the original Illuminati conspirators. But to conceal that fact, most of them changed their original family names to American sounding names. For example, the true name of the Dillons, Clarence and Douglas Dillon, 
once Secretary of the U.S. Treasury Department, is Lepowski. There is a similar establishment of the Illuminati in England, operating under the name of the British Institute of International Affairs. There are similar secret Illuminati organizations in France, Germany, and other nations operating under different names. But at all times, the operations of these organizations were and are masterminded and controlled by the internationalist bankers who in turn were and are controlled by the Rothschilds. Now, just why did the conspirators choose the word Illuminati for their satanic organization? Weishaupt himself said that the word is derived from Lucifer and means holders of the light. Using the lie that his objective was to bring about a one world government to enable those with mental ability to govern the world and prevent all wars in the future, in short, using the word peace on earth as his bait. Perhaps the most vital directive in Weishaupt's plan was to obtain absolute control of the press so that all news and information could be slanted so that the masses could be convinced that a one world government is the only solution to our many and varied problems. Now do you know who owns and controls our mass communications media? I'll tell you, practically all the movie lots in Hollywood is owned by the Laymans, Kuhn Loeb and Company, Goldman Sachs, and other internationalist bankers. All the national radio and TV channels in the nation are owned and controlled by those same internationalist bankers. In 1834, the Italian revolutionary leader, Giuseppe Mazzini, was selected by the Illuminati to direct their revolutionary program throughout the world. Mazzini had enticed an American general named Albert Pike into the Illuminati. Pike was fascinated by the idea of a one world government, and ultimately he became the head of this Luciferian conspiracy. Between 1859 and 1871, he, Pike, worked out a military blueprint for three world wars and various revolutions throughout the world, which he considered would forward the conspiracy to its final stage in the 20th century. Long before Marconi invented radio, the scientists in the Illuminati had found the means for Pike and the heads of his councils to communicate secretly. It was the discovery of that secret that enabled intelligence officers to understand how apparently unrelated incidents, one such as the assassination of an Austrian prince at Sarajevo, took place simultaneously throughout the world, which developed into a war or a revolution. Pike's plan was as simple as it has proved effective. It called for communism, Nazism, political Zionism, and other international movements be organized and used to foment three global world wars and at least two major revolutions. World War III is to be fomented by using the so-called controversies, the agents of the Illuminati, operating under whatever new name, are now stirring up between the political Zionists and the leaders of the Muslim world. That war is to be directed in such a manner that all of Islam and political Zionism, Israel, will destroy each other, while at the same time, the remaining nations once more divided on this issue will be forced to fight themselves into a state of complete exhaustion, physically, mentally, spiritually, and economically. Now, can any thinking person doubt that the intrigue now going on in the near, middle, and far east is designed to accomplish that satanic objective? Pike himself foretold all this in a statement he made to Mazzini 
on August 15, 1871. Pike stated that after World War III is ended, those who will inspire to undisputed world domination will provoke the greatest social cataclysm the world has ever known. Quoting his own words, taken from the letter he wrote to Mazzini, and which letter is now catalogued in the British Museum in London, England, he said, we shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a great social cataclysm which in all its horror will show clearly to all nations the effect of absolute atheism, the origin of savagery and of most bloody turmoil. Then everywhere, the people forced to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity, whose deistic spirits will be from that moment on without direction and leadership, and anxious for an ideal but without knowledge where to send its adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer, brought finally out into public view, a manifestation which will result from a general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism both conquered and exterminated at the same time. Anyway, the ending of the Civil War destroyed, temporarily, all chances of the House of Rothschild to get a clutch on our money system, such as they had acquired in Britain and other nations in Europe. I say temporarily because the Rothschilds and the masterminds of the conspiracy never quit. So they had to start from scratch but they lost no time in getting started. Shortly after the Civil War, a young immigrant who called himself Jacob H. Schiff arrived in New York. Jacob was a young man with a mission for the House of Rothschild. Jacob was the son of a rabbi, born in one of Rothschild's houses in Frankfurt, Germany. After a comparatively brief training period in the Rothschild's London Bank, Jacob left for America with instructions to buy into a banking house, which was to be the springboard to acquire control of the money system of the United States. Actually, Jacob came here to carry out four specific assignments. Number one, and most important, was to acquire control of America's money system. Number two, find desirable men who, for a price, would be willing to serve as stooges for the great conspiracy and promote them into high places in our federal government, our Congress, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and all federal agencies. Number three, create minority group strife throughout the nations, particularly between whites and blacks. Number four, create a movement to destroy religion in the United States, but Christianity to be the chief target. In the final phases of the conspiracy, the one world government will consist of the king dictator, head of the United Nations, the CFR, and a few billionaires, economists, and scientists who have proved their devotion to the great conspiracy. All others are to be integrated into a vast conglomeration of mongrelized humanity, actually slaves. door meeting of fellow internationalists, billionaire and former CFR chairman David Rockefeller praised his media allies, but his confidence that his words would not leave the room was later broken. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other publications 
whose directors have attended our meetings and restricted their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subject to the bright lights of publicity. But the world is now more sophisticated and prepared to march toward a world government. That these men aim to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. In short, they seek total and quiet control of the entire world. Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. The Council on Foreign Relations is well known among researchers of parapolitics as one of the organizations of interest directing Washington's foreign policy. Once derided as conspiracy theory, the influence of the group is now a truism that is openly joked about in Washington's foreign policy circles. It's good to be back at the Council on Foreign Relations. As uh, Pete mentioned, I've been a member for a long time and was actually a director for some period of time. I never mentioned that when I was campaigning for re-election back home in Wyoming. Thank you very much, um, Richard, and I am delighted to be here in these new headquarters. Um, I have been often to, uh, I guess, the mothership in New York City. Uh, but it's good to have an outpost of the council right here down the street from the State Department. Uh, we get a lot of advice from the council, so this will mean I won't have as far to go to uh, be told uh, what we should be doing and uh, how uh, we should uh, think about the future. What many do not know, however, is that the CFR is in fact a branch of a slightly older, slightly less known organization, the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Born from the ashes of war-ravaged Europe following the Great War, the idea for the RIIA was forged at an informal session during the 1919 Paris Peace Conference. The Institute was formalized the next year, first as the British Institute of International Affairs and then, after receiving its royal charter, as the Royal Institute of International Affairs. The group became synonymous with Chatham House, its headquarters in St. James's Square in London and is widely recognized among foreign policy experts as the most influential think tank in the world. In a world of growing interdependence, the need for rigorous and independent analysis has never been greater. This is true first in the area of international economics, where the global financial crisis and the rise of the G20 are completely changing the international context. Second, we have competition for resources, for oil, for gas, but also for food and water, and how this is interacting with changing climates. Then third, there's the changing balance between the established powers and the rising powers, and what this means for security. Chatham House works across these three areas, in international economics, in energy, environment, and resource governance, and in regional and security studies. We publish reports, we publish papers, we hold discussions and conferences, and we discuss our ideas with policymakers from around the world. In the years since its inception, the RIIA has opened branches in countries across the British Commonwealth and around the world, including the Council on Foreign Relations, born largely from the same 1919 Paris meeting that birthed the Institute itself, the Australian Institute of International Affairs, the South African Institute of International Affairs, the Pakistan Institute of International Affairs, the Canadian International Council, and similar organizations. Officially, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, like its various branch organizations, is a non-profit, non-governmental think tank that promotes analysis of international issues and world affairs in four main research areas – energy, environment and resources, international economics, international security, and area studies and international law. Also like its branch organizations, the majority of the group's publications and proceedings are open to the public and freely available via their website or their journal. International Affairs. Funded by partners, patrons, and corporate members that read like a who's who of the Fortune 500, including Chevron, AIG, Bloomberg, Toshiba, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Lockheed Martin, Royal Dutch Shell, the European Commission, and dozens of other corporations, institutions, and foreign governments, Chatham House consistently attracts some of the best-known speakers on a wide range of topics, releasing reports that set the global policy agenda not only for Britain, 
but for much of the rest of the developed world as well. We have further challenging issues to address between now and 2015, including how to take account of countries' common but differentiated responsibilities for tackling climate change. By moving towards a spectrum of commitments that reflects the economic realities of the 21st century, the current binary divide between developing and developed countries was defined in 1990, and I believe it's time to move on from it. Uh, the role of policymakers is actually to try to manage this transition and to understand that we are living through a very different time. And I stress that this time is really different from other periods in recent history where we discuss the reform of the monetary system. So managing a transition means more policy cooperation. Militaries around the world aspire to our standards and the ability of our forces to work together. Importantly, we can integrate other nations' contributions into complex multinational operations like no other organization. Although the majority of its activities are publicly accessible, it is perhaps tellingly for its policy on keeping certain meetings private that the organization is best known. The policy is called the Chatham House Rule and states, when a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House Rule, participants are free to use the information received, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers nor that of any other participant may be revealed. The rule is ostensibly invoked to encourage debate on contentious issues, the theory being that prominent individuals would not be willing or able to discuss their full views on these subjects if their identity and affiliations were to be publicly known. Some of the most infamous and criticized secretive meetings in the world, including the Bilderberg Conference, adhere to Chatham House rules, inviting charges of secrecy and hidden influence. When it comes to a group like the Royal Institute of International Affairs, it is hard to argue that such charges are misplaced. Last week on The Eye Opener, we heard author G. Edward Griffin present the history of the Roundtable Group, founded by Cecil Rhodes, and how it functioned as a structure of rings within rings, where the members of the outer, public Roundtable front groups had little understanding of what went on in the inner circles of the group's secretive core membership. It was precisely from this Rhodes-created secret society that the Royal Institute of International Affairs and its various branches, including the Council on Foreign Relations, emerged. According to noted historian, Brookings researcher, Defense Department consultant, and Bill Clinton mentor, Professor Carol Quigley, the genesis of Rhodes' roundtable group emerged from a meeting in February 1891 between Cecil Rhodes, journalist William Stead, and the future Lord Escher, Reginald Balliol Brett. In this conversation, it was decided that the group would be divided into an inner circle, called the Society of the Elect, and an outer circle, known as the Association of Helpers. Within the Society of the Elect would be a core group, including Rhodes himself and a so-called Hunta of Three, who would in fact exercise authority within the overall organization. The Junta was to consist of Stead, Lord Escher, and Alfred Milner. Milner was a journalist who was plucked from obscurity by Stead, who made him assistant editor at the Pell Mell Gazette. After a series of political appointments, Stead and Rhodes used their influence to have him appointed High Commissioner for South Africa in 1897, an important and influential position in the years leading up to the Boer War. Milner mentored a group of young lawyers and administrators, mostly affiliated with Oxford University, who became known as Milner's Kindergarten. These figures went on to become some of the most influential figures in the foreign affairs of the early 20th century British Empire, including Lord Lothian, Philip Henry Carr, Robert Henry Brand of Lazard Brothers, First Baron Tweedsmere, and Lionel Curtis, the founder of the Royal Institute of International Affairs. In a rare recorded interview, Professor Quigley described in detail how this Rhodes-founded roundtable group exerted power in international affairs in the first half of the 20th century through organizations like Chatham House. Uh, the inquiry uh, got together in Paris and agreed to establish an organization out of which came the Royal Institute of International Affairs. And that Royal Institute of International Affairs had branches in all of the Commonwealth countries, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, eventually in India, and they even, uh, uh, I think, had one somewhere else. 
uh, Pakistan when it divided. They established one. But in the United States, of course, they didn't have to because they had the constant foreign relations. But when they came over here, uh, coming back from Paris, they found that a movement had begun here already to form a Council on Foreign Relations, so they moved in and took it over, and they could do that because they represented Morgan. According to Quigley, the group was responsible for the Boer War, the establishment of the Rhodes Trust, the control of the Times, the formation of the League of Nations, the formation of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, and the appeasement of Nazi Germany, amongst other events. In recent years, Chatham House, its most visible mouthpiece, has been responsible for reports on why gold is not a viable alternative to the current international monetary system. An analysis of the 2009 Iranian election that informed reports around the globe about the irregularities of that election, an op-ed from the British Foreign Secretary urging for a thoroughgoing weaponization of cyberspace, amongst many other influential documents, publications, conferences, and presentations. In the end, what is perhaps most intriguing to those who are interested in examining how power functions in society is not necessarily the secretive origins of a group like the Royal Institute of International Affairs, or even the way that it has covertly manipulated, shaped, and controlled British foreign policy for decades, or how it has managed to wield such considerable influence over world affairs through its various branch organizations. Instead, what is most fascinating about Chatham House is that it is so very much open. Many of its meetings and proceedings are publicly available. Its partners and corporate members are published on its website. Its journal is accessible to all. Its history, once shrouded in mystery, has been laid bare for over half a century thanks to the work of scholars like Quigley. And yet still, for all that, the RIIA is rarely discussed as an important power center in 21st century society. In some ways, perhaps this is its greatest accomplishment. To hide its enormous influence and its ongoing role in steering global geopolitics, not by hiding under a blanket of secrecy like the Bilderberg Group, Skull and Bones, or other secret societies, but by putting itself so much in the public spotlight that it seems mundane. It should be noted, after all, that this is precisely the way the Rhodes, that Rhodes envisioned such an organization would function, and the continued existence and influence of that idea, manifested most openly in Chatham House, the CFR, and their brethren think tanks around the world, might serve as the perfect example of how some of the world's biggest secrets are hidden in plain sight. This video is brought to you by the subscribers of BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information on this and other topics, please go to BoilingFrogsPost.com. For more information and commentary from James Corbett, please go to CorbettReport.com.